On December the 14th, 2012, a 20 year old man called Adam Lanza murdered 20 young children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. It was one of the worst mass shootings in US history. A man called Alex Jones, he has a popular radio show and a website called InfoWars, has said that the killings never took place. He suggested that the murders were staged to promote a left-wing gun control agenda. I'm seeing this, I'm worried about it. It's brewing a lot of cultural dissension, it's brewing disunity, it's really breeding mistrust. It's hard to know where, where to draw the line. The line between free speech and potentially unsafe speech is blurry. And it, because it just seems very, 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 very fuzzy. The one, one person's offensive speech is somebody else's hate speech very, very often. But then there's this sort of gray area where there's stuff that is likely false or uh, maybe the truth has been stretched. What we're doing there is giving people the option to tell us that something's fake and then running it past third party factual organizations to get a sense of whether or not it is in fact fake. Right now what you believe is a total hoax. And so as opposed to monetizing data around the users, like all these other companies have done, we're actually monetizing data around fake news. Fake accounts and Facebook pages that were involved in what it described as coordinated, inauthentic behavior. Most importantly, a willingness to buy into conspiracy theory. And then at some point or another, it doesn't bump into the most famous conspiracy theory that the Jews run the world. Right, that they believe that this is some sort of live action role playing thing and a troll on the mainstream media. They believe that like, the whole point of it is to make legal precedent for rules governing speech in the digital world. To this point, a lot of this has been, I think, fairly reactionary. It's taken a long time. You know, there's been people uh, cultivating specific ideas which we, they then might be willing to carry out. They're announcing a new Justice Department mega unit with their number one national directive to go after adversaries are using social media networks to create chaos in the United States. Lawmakers were warned that social media is increasingly creating a warped illusion. It's war-level propaganda. And so that's why we're not removing this content generally. What we're doing is putting related articles and information about the publisher of that content. And the challenge of trying to control some of that content uh, within certain limitations without being charged with censorship and again it goes back to just sort of are they journalists or are they just uh, conspiracy mongers conspiracy theories we will believe it and that's happening particularly in countries that have less trust in media the first target for conspiracy theorists and, and people that wanted someone to attack never mind proof it doesn't matter to these people they want to hate the mainstream media. And they were pre-planning before it and rolled out with it. Well, this year, we started separating the attacks into three different types of tiers based on severity. The frameworks for speech have changed with the, uh, with the era of the social platforms. But um, a tier one, a very severe hate speech attack under our policies, could be any other type of call for violence, even if it's not credible. And what you do when you have someone like Alex Jones, who a lot of people may listen to. They play on our emotions, they play on our anger and our fear and our xenophobia and our misgiving and our political rancor, like, it's, they're playing on our nature. That the September 11th attacks were an inside government job. Representing fake Jews. Of which the media is one, but others include Congress, the courts, and the Federal Reserve. Hollywood, academia, banking, the press. Not just one, but many institutions here. Conservatives and veterans and gun owners. Alex Jones occupies a unique place in the current post-truth era. With passion and a bellowing voice, he presents, or perhaps more accurately, manufactures an endless number of conspiracy theories. The world is governed by small groups of people who operate behind the scenes and are enormously powerful and enormously evil. Any promotion of conspiracy theories is dangerous because the logical conclusion of such thinking is anti-Semitism. So, um... Look, that is a thing that is out there. This this case may be important in terms of figuring out how you police this. So this is not um, this is not a small thing. It's, it's, it's definitely that. getting at the uh, most perniciously dangerous, I would say, parts of the internet. And if it spills into real life, we're we're in deep trouble. That said, we've been investing heavily in tools that can proactively flag 
violating content. And I'll tell you, there's a couple areas where this is working really well. Hate speech, I am optimistic that over five to 10 year period, we will have AI tools that can uh, get into some of the nuances, the linguistic nuances of, of, of different types of content to be more accurate and flagging things for our systems. So he's talking, David McCabe, about artificial intelligence someday being able to make these judgments that I was just talking about. We now have technical tools that can flag the vast majority of that content before anybody in the community sends it to us or sees it at all. And that determines if we're going to act on the conspiracy theories we believe in. So for instance, terror propaganda. It's outrageous claims to gain attention. Now we remove, of the terror propaganda that we remove from Facebook, more than 99% of that are technical tools find before anybody in our community flags it for us. Before it breaks democracy. And that it's important to look at the dissemination patterns. How is this content being amplified? For you as you browse against fake news. We look at the voice, you know, who are the people who are pushing this content? We look at the content itself. Is it, um, you know, is it, is it incitements to violence? Does it violate terms of service? And if it is, then... Undoubtedly, there's a cover-up, there's actors, they're manipulating, they've been caught lying. And as you browse, we'll essentially tell you whether the content that you're seeing is safe, unsafe, or has a warning attached to it. We will show related articles from around the internet. Whenever somebody sees that article in their, in their news feed, they will also see the related articles. About where we draw the line between what's free speech and what's hate speech. Hate speech will get you suspended or kicked off the platform. And we'll also devote the likely false content so that it's not likely to become viral and it won't be seen by as many people. When you have this mass consolidation of audiences uh, onto a handful of platforms because you need to be monetizing their attention. And we can make some money off of it by advertising. When you do this sort of thing, I've seen it in my own social groups. People stop talking to each other. People stop socializing with each other, which means people don't work together on community-wide issues because that fundamental mistrust. And that is very sophisticated. Because what you're saying is it's not enough just to see the model strike the bobo doll with the hammer. That isn't what actually causes the children to then imitate the adult. It's actually seeing what happens to the model. Because you're always asking yourself, if I do this, am I going to be penalized or rewarded? And so you have this feedback loop where you keep users on site, you feed them ads, you, you monitor their behavior. But it's all going to be wonderful, never expecting, never expecting that uh, it would be used as a tool to manipulate political campaigns, never expecting that it would turn into the dissemination of, of garbage information, that it would be used to spread offensive ideas. Social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Google have been under intense scrutiny over various privacy and fake news scandals. And that being said, when you look at the speed at which legislation is implemented, uh, we're at a huge disadvantage in terms of being able to keep up with the technology that exists. And that's part of the power of Facebook, is that all these social networks, is that if you do something... We will reach out to our legal team, and they'll assess that, and if appropriate, they'll actually send that to law enforcement. And what winds up happening is, if every single thing you do in your life is monitored, it is wishful thinking believe that we're always going to be able to identify persistent actors with high confidence. Trying to see belief among those who they feel are vulnerable. It, it, it has risen to the level where it doesn't matter if you're one or five people, you can impact millions. You're right, you're right, and that's, that's a massive problem to a big battleground, especially for fake news. And that's because the speech is algorithmically amplified. And it's fostered and accelerated a climate of hate and anti-Semitism. And that's a rather large platform with which to do some substantial harm if you can. The automated accounts of the far left and the far right extremes of the American political spectrum produce as many as 25 to 30 times the number of messages per day on average as genuine political accounts across the mainstream. So, you know, cyber attacks um, and disinformation have become more and more linked here. The battlefield of the future is in the minds of Americans but has also revealed itself to be a phenomenal tool for propagandists. With terror propaganda, and so I think the government, with the, I know the Senate Intelligence Committee is having a hearing on this, they're going to be talking about the links between disinformation and cyber attacks. And let's take just as an example, they have a policy against um, hate speech. 
We also have policies against terror organizations and their members, hate organizations. To identify them or even to do anything about them. But I want to say to the point we're making about disinformation, it's of course not just disinformation. Some of it is the really cheap, get out there, bots, fake accounts, you know, spreading all sorts of disinformation. But, but the spreading of the disinformation, I mean, in a way, planting this information. It's, it's designed in a way to be valid for people. It's propaganda people can often dismiss more easily, you know. I think that's kind of the point, is that disinformation is easier to just kind of accept. If someone posts false information, it will get corrected pretty quickly. One other thing that I find fascinating is that the fake media is trying to silence us. But we will not let them. The only problem is I've watched a lot of soap operas. And I've seen actors before. And I know when I'm watching a movie, I don't want to watch something real. That's why he said it, it really refers to those who aren't always telling the truth. It's show and it's propaganda. That's exactly right. It's not so much what's in your head and heart as it is you looking around. Exactly. So that the anonymity behind the internet also makes a lot of these campaigns a lot easier to carry out by, by bad actors because that it's much harder to attribute actions back to an individual. A major institution in our society, the press. Whatever the reason, it does seem to be an increasingly dangerous time for Jews. The Anti-Defamation League says... It's a matter of victims continuing to be re-victimized. And interestingly, he mentioned the Holocaust, Holocaust deniers. Mark Zuckerberg recently was interviewed on a podcast in which he said that even though he believes the Holocaust happened and is real... So that it really was just a, uh, a fraud. Now, George Soros happens to be Jewish. That means conspiracy theories are for losers about how... There's no way of knowing what's going on inside. This is not something that they are cooking up themselves. They are just promoting conversations that are already happening online. You actually have to have people in all of these thousands and thousands of groups saying... That every private enterprise has to function as your own personal platform. And so, this court case, I hope what it will prove, or at least what it will show to people, is that people that choose to listen to somebody like Alex Jones make America great again, which is not very fake news. So they have to make do with whoever's left. And so those that stay behind are oftentimes not ideological. Seeing what's acceptable, seeing what's okay, seeing what people will tolerate. But if actually audiences don't know to be worried, they're not flagging it, so fact checkers. So These uh, people shouldn't have a place on Earth. In fact, a listener of Alex Jones who believed what he said stalked them and issued death threats. And, and it, it's not a credible call for violence. Nevertheless, we would deem that a very serious hate speech attack. Once we can start developing appropriate norms and rules that set limits on how these platforms should and should not be used, I think we'll start to see the health of these ecosystems improve and you know, the health of our democracy improve over time. Or post photographs that are borderline pornography. And that introduced me to a side of this world and a side of human nature that up until that point, I, I didn't even believe existed. How do you unlearn that if you learn that when you're five or ten years old? I don't know how you do it. Well, you know, some would say we're watching um, Alex Jones of InfoWars. And if in order to win, he needs to fan the flames of conspiracy, then he is perfectly willing to do it. So what his lawyers say is that he's a... We wanted to hide uh, from you or that we tried everything to he says is opinion and should be taken as opinion. Because this is how he built his coalition. He put together a coalition of conspiracy theorists. And a lot of the conspiracy theorists, the people that make these videos and the people that email me or, or contact me. They're not used to searching the internet to see whether something is true, cross-referencing it with information from news websites. Knowingly uh, leading them down false avenues and is giving them information that is not trustworthy. They're giving emotion over information. Unfortunately, the speech quite often leads to harassment, which silences other people's speech. That we do need to discuss, we do need to report on what he's saying, we need to report on the facts, we need to report that journalism, I think, has never been work, working harder, and I think doing we're doing good work. Knowing how to appeal to the resentments and hatreds of his face. The old fire, which was the explosive used to destroy the Oklahoma City uh, Federal Building. And it's through these kinds of illicit activities that many of them are recruited. 
Today marks the start of another case against Alex Jones, the founder of InfoWars. It's the second case this week in Austin, Texas. Jones is being sued for defamation for things he said on his media platforms. Jones hasn't appeared in court this week, but he has been on the air on his radio show. The entire leftist deep state, the entire foundation combine is launching attacks on InfoWars. And because it had so much more rich information on our interests and our connections and our habits, and even once we put on our mobile phones, our location, right, it, tra it could trace us. Is that going to be a free extension, or how, how will that work? Yeah, this will be a completely free extension. Uh, for example, originally, the act allowed you to subpoena what they call metadata, which is... One is that... We think he's authentic. These alerts are then targeted. What do you think is at stake when it comes to the First Amendment with these cases? It's this this um, gets into a complicated terrain. Most perniciously dangerous, I would say. But these are really complicated questions. And which, you know, if, if we are going to use the First Amendment to, <laughs> as the conceptual framing here, um, there's also a right to freedom of assembly. There's a potential for everybody to be misidentified. And by saying things that are counter to the social norms, we see that he's revealing something about himself that's different from every other person. Does a model get rewarded? Does a model get punished? It's that action that then determines whether the children imitate the model. If you work at the Boston Globe, the paper coordinating this week's action, you are protected by the First Amendment. They, they can hide behind something. They hide behind their screen names, uh, their fake email addresses, their fake social media accounts. A political influence operation on their network. You've got a sense what the source for this, or uh, well, clearly there are lots of sources, but it, is anybody joining the dots back, for example, to anti-slap laws, which are essentially laws that make it harder for people to bring sort of frivolous defamation suits that are only for the purpose of silencing people and making them pay steep legal fees to to have their free speech rights. Start taking those types of posts down. Uh, one, one area where they have kind of made a change recently on disinformation particularly is when disinformation might lead to violence directly on the ground. They've, they've said that they'll start pulling that. So let's listen to some more of your listeners. Harm to free speech all you want. They have a right to disable anybody's account if they find issue with it. The concept of free speech is inapplicable to a company like Facebook. It's a private organization and has no obligation to publish any particular content. People misunderstand what free speech is about. Free speech means the government. I mean, this looks like a losing battle. You could know everything about us. In terms of who gets to have a voice on any platform. The conspiracy theory claim, there, there's definitely a, a thread that goes through all of it, that it, it is at some level an attempt to limits or control things that they have not predicted that nobody has predicted that reached hundreds of thousands of people that they may be responding to a year from now and they got there because of two separate crimes and the first crime was really kind of basic stuff like what number is calling what number and how long the call lasts under a law that protects free speech against attacks some of it is also cyber attacks and bots are not only on just twitter there's we've actually even seen bots on youtube for example there's a combination of human beings and machine learning, bots, computers. Promoting anti-Semitism. But we will have um, a little narrower definition about uh, how we will define what those protected characteristics are. So for example, these big brands actually care how their brands are being portrayed uh, and how they're being misportrayed. Despite the fact that they are the world's largest social network, there are two billion people using it every month. You also need to know quite a lot about them in order for the ads to be relevant. The data is held by the companies rather than the government. People think the First Amendment applies to Facebook. Yes. And it does not. The First Amendment does not govern social media. It governs governments for identifying fake news. For how it thinks it can solve this problem. As a government, and yet people are shrugging their shoulders. We're not going to be able to see eye to eye on that. It was going to be great, right? <laughs>